I'm Tyler with 138 MMA. I'm here to break down UFC 278, get you the full card, breakdown, and predictions. Let's do the dang thing. All right, so kicking off the night, we have Victor Altamirano taking on Daniel Da Silva. So now let's start with Daniel Da Silva. He's three and two on his last five uh, fights. What I like about him, all offense, all the time. Guy doesn't take any breaks, comes in 100%, mixes up his striking well. He'll go to the legs, the body, the head. Takes, takes his time to mix in those strikes, go everywhere. He keeps you guessing, but he also will mix in the takedowns. He mixes in the takedowns, and that's often where he finds his most success. However, we haven't seen that in the UFC. He's lost his last two fights, and he's been finished. So that's a problem there. Uh, he, can get, he can start to gas out due to the, uh, to the high output that he brings to the, to the cage. And in, in addition to that, awful striking defense. His striking differential is absolutely terrible. On the UFC website, it is one of the worst I've ever seen. So not a lot of pluses on these three down here, but some really high upside on his offensive output. For Victor Altamirano, a little better record on the way in, five, uh, four and one in his last five. Um, he has great striking volume, or good, I guess. I wouldn't say great, good striking volume. Uh, he can keep you at range well as uh, with that as well. So uh, using his range and good striking volume, it's going to be trouble for Daniel's, uh, Daniel Da Silva here. Uh, he also has pretty decent takedown defense. So when he does start mixing in those takedowns, it's going to be hard for him to close that distance and get that takedown. However, it's been a very close last two fights. So for Victor Altamirano, his last two fights were both split decision. A, a lot of people think that the uh, decision on Dana White's contender series that he, was, that he won, he actually should have lost that. Whereas his fight in the UFC where he lost... A lot of people thought he actually should have won that. So that a lot of people go against the split decisions, but what else is new? That's the way it always is. But he keeps his fights too close, and that's what I'm getting at here. Uh, Daniel De Silva versus Victor Altamirano. If that comes down to a close fight, sometimes that aggression and high output can get you the nod. Daniel De Silva, live dog here. Um, originally, it was supposed to be Jake Hadley taking on Victor Altamirano. However, De Silva comes in. Like I said, live dog. However, my choice for this fight... Right there. I'm taking Victor Altamirano. I think he'll probably get it done by decision. I wouldn't even be surprised if it was a split decision. Moving right along to fight number two, we have Rishi Lang versus Jay Perrin. Both guys, three and two in their last five fights. Should be a good matchup. In fact, it is my prediction for the fight of the night. First, let's break down Rishi Lang. Something that is uh, a, bit, a bit to question here is his record changed leading into this fight. And obviously he didn't fight before, right before this fight. But somehow it changed. So, not sure if they found a regional fight that they didn't know existed, but it changed. So that was strange. However, he does have a higher level of competition. So, he may not always come out as the victor, but he has fought a lot better competition than Jay Perrin has. So there is that to pull from, some of that experience. He does have a high volume of strikes. So, when Rishi Lang's coming at you, he's throwing constantly, typically. But, sometimes he will take one to give one. So, or to give a few. So if Jay Perrin's swinging at him, he may eat one of those, but he's th throwing three, four, five back at him. Um, the problem with that is he does also have a hard time with wrestlers, and Jay Perrin is a wrestler. As you see here, he has a high takedown volume. Also, solid takedown accuracy. I believe on the UFC website, it is listed at about 60%. 60% uh, takedown accuracy is pretty good against somebody who struggles with wrestlers. Um, and he has a ton of rear naked choke wins in his career, most of which on the regional scene. Actually, all of which on the regional scene. So there is that. But he does get hit. So the way I see this fight going, either Arishi Lang is going to be able to piece Jay Perrin up on the feet, hit him because he is easy to hit, or Jay Perrin puts on a total wrestling clinic, takes him down, mauls him, maybe even gets the rear naked choke. But either way, I think this is going to be the fight of the night. To give you a pick, I will say I'm going to go ahead and take the underdog here and go with Jay Perrin for this fight. Taking the dog. In our third fight of the night, we have Amir Albazi taking on Francisco Figueredo. So in this fight here, 4-1 in his last five for Amir Albazi, 3-1-1 for Figueredo. I'm going to start with Fra uh, Francisco Figueredo for this one. So Francisco is really good at picking his shots. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't throw a lot of volume, which can hurt him over the course of a fight. However, when he does swing, he's aiming right down the target. That's why they call him the sniper. He's getting you. He's going to hit you. He has a good, um, good accuracy on his strikes, but low volume. So there's, you know, some give and take there. Um, something he does that is a bit unorthodox is he holds his hands kind of low, but that makes those strikes come out from different angles, which can be a good thing, but also means that he can get hit. 
Uh, with that, he has a great ground game, something that he gets overlooked for quite a bit. Um, Francisco Figueredo actually finished his last fight with a sick knee bar. I don't know if anybody saw this, but it was good. It was it was clean. It looked really quick. It came out of nowhere. Uh, Figueredo showed that he he can hang on the ground. However, for Amir Albazi, he's the busier guy on the feet, so he's going to be throwing shots, but I'd rather see him grapple because that's where his bread gets buttered. He is a high-level grappler, and that if he can get top position in this fight, I think that he can control the, the bulk of this fight. He will have to w watch out for uh, submissions from the bottom from Figueredo, but Albazi is probably going to be your better fighter on the top in this situation. Something that concerns me, though, he's had a lot of injuries lately. Uh, a lot of his fights have... He's either had to pull out or wasn't able to get scheduled because he has had some injuries. Um, not really sure what those are, but in an interview, he did mention that he's had some injuries lately. So that's that's the issue there. A little bit of ring rust, and we just don't want him to fall in love with the strikes on the feet because Figueredo is a sniper, hence the name. Uh, something that's a little interesting fact is they both fought uh, Malcolm Gordon, I believe it is, and MMA math says Amir Albazi should win this fight because Amir Albazi beat Malcolm Gordon, whereas... Francisco Figueredo, that is his loss in the UFC. So MMA math is usually completely disregarded because it, it doesn't really really add up. Ma MMA math does not add up. But that said, I'm still going to go with the favorite here in Amir Albazi. However, these odds are way too steep for me. I wouldn't fault anybody for taking a shot at Francisco Figueredo here as a pretty live dog. All right, in our fourth fight, in the last of the early prelims, we have A.J. Fletcher taking on Ange Lusa. A.J. Fletcher, 4-1 and one in his last five fights. His only loss coming to Matthew Semmelsberger, which was a big step up in competition for him, didn't go his way. Ange Lusa, on the other hand, 2-3 and three in his last five fights. He hasn't really had much success in the UFC yet. Who knows, this could be that, that chance for him against someone else who hasn't seen a lot of success in the UFC yet. So, starting with A.J. Fletcher. Very fast starter with a high volume of takedowns. He's going to use his power shots to set up those takedowns. AJ Fletcher is going to come at you hard. He's going to try and get you taken down. If he does, he has a great finish rate, most of which are being submissions. And that's typically on the regional scene against that lower level of competition. In fact, all of that is on the regional scene. For Angelusa, he has a massive reach advantage. Seven inches, in fact. So if he can use that seven inches of reach advantage to keep AJ Fletcher away or even if he can just make him pay for coming in for those uh, those takedown attempts, that could pay, pay out well for him in the end of the fight. Something he also does is he mixes up his striking and grappling well. So for Angelusa, if he can hit AJ Fletcher on the way in and put the grappling on his terms, he might be able to use that for his, uh, for his path to victory here. So the problem, though, is he has a low volume. So when AJ Fletcher's coming in, Angelusa needs to let his hands go. Something he struggled with a bit in his UFC run so far is he's let he's not let his hands go enough and in fact he will get hit standing there waiting for his shot so he does eat a lot of shots he doesn't doesn't throw back enough but he does have the physical tools here to get the job done he's probably the more powerful striker um he's gonna be able to you know use that seven inches of reach to keep fletcher away a lot of people are picking lusa here however typically i like to go with the higher level grappler i do think fletcher's gonna get this one done so I'll take him to get the win. Not confident in this fight whatsoever, but I will take Fletcher. All right, fifth fight of the night, kicking off our regular prelims. We've got Miranda Maverick taking on Shannon Young. I'm not going to waste too much time on this one. Miranda Maverick is 3-2 and two in her last five. Uh, Shannon Young, she's 2-3 and three in the last five. Maverick, a lot of people argued she's 4-1 and one in the last five. That split decision loss to Macy Barber was razor thin. I had it going for Maverick, and I was cheering for Barber, so that says something about that. So, But anyway, uh, first, let's start with Shana Young here because there's not a lot to highlight. Four inches of height, could use that, I guess. Uh, she has a college wrestling background, but she doesn't really show a whole lot from that as well. Shana Young, you know, you want, if you want to root for a massive underdog, get out, your, get out your popcorn and cheer for her. I don't see her winning this fight at all. Miranda Maverick has already beaten Young once. She choked her out in the first round of, uh, I believe it was like a one-night tournament or something like that. I don't know how that works, but it was some sort of tournament. One, They were doing one-round fights, I think. Anyway, Maverick choked her out in the first round, made it look easy. She should be better everywhere. Pick Miranda Maverick pretty much whatever way she wants to do it. I don't see Shannon Young winning this. Short of We've got our sixth fight of the night, Sean Woodson taking on Luis Saldana. So four and one for each of these guys in their last five fights. I'm going to start with Sean Woodson here. Massive reach advantage, six inches. 
So good volume, decent power. Guy, the guy can use his range, hit that those that good volume, but he has you know all right power, kind of a death by a thousand cuts or something like that. Kind of takes you down slowly, but when he hits, you feel it. Not enough to just one shot you typically. Could happen, not enough in most of his fights thus far. Uh, does strike at range very well. Uses that six inches of reach uh, to his advantage on the regular. And he does have that sweet flying knee KO of Terrence McKinney, who has actually been on a pretty good tear lately. So that, that win holds up pretty well. Put some stock in Sean Woodson, if you ask me. For Luis Saldana, he is probably the more well-rounded fighter. Uh, and if the fight does get to the ground, he is probably the better fighter on the ground. It's just not likely to get there. So Danya is usually willing to stand and trade, will get into a war with you, does keep his hands low, and has a weaker gas tank. So I'm not going to waste too much time here. We've got another fight where I'm just going to say that the clear favorite should get the W. I'm taking Sean Woodson. Next up, we've got Leonardo Santos taking on Jared Gordon. Both guys coming in 3-2 and two in their last five fights. I'm going to start with Leonardo Santos here. So, for Leonardo Santos, obviously the bigger guy. He's going to have a huge reach advantage. Couldn't tell you how much exactly, but it's huge. Uh, 42 years old. He also, his age is starting to catch up to him. So, 42 years old, he gasses out quick now. He hasn't always been that way. Used to be, uh, used to be a little bit better, able to keep that pace, but some, somewhere along the lines, it's faded. So, now, uh, the, the wins against Stevie Ray back in 2019 where he knocked him out. Those, those aren't coming along as well. Stevie Ray doing big things over in PFL. Back-to-back -back wins over Anthony Pettis. Uh, looking really good these days. But so that, that, the win age as well, Leonardo Santos hasn't so much. Uh, his last fight, he was fighting Clay Guida. Looked good right away. Came out pretty strong. Guida just put a pace on him and was able to get the win. Early on in the fight, uh, Santos gassed out quick. So that, 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 that win came pretty early. Uh, next, we're looking at Jared Gordon here. So... Gordon, similar to Guida in Santos' last fight, he can put a pace on somebody with high output, has good cardio. So here for Jared Gordon, that's going to be the path to victory. Put that pace on him, keep him on, keep him, uh, keep him on his back foot. You know, keep him moving backwards, putting the putting the high striking output, get the takedowns working in, keep it moving. However, if Santos can land flush, I'm concerned about Jared Gordon's chin. Why is that? Because Santos can still throw some bombs. And Gordon's been knocked out in the past. Uh, something else that would be that uh, is an interesting little thing to note: both guys have a common opponent in Grant Dawson, and he has finished both of them. So, good way to uh, good way to get the common denominator here on these guys. Uh, Jared Gordon, like I said, chin concerns, but otherwise, I'm taking him to win this fight. Shouldn't be too tough for him. Leonardo Santos is just too far past his prime. Right into the featured prelim, we have Marcin Tybura taking on Alexander Romanov. Uh, for Tybura, he's coming in 4-1 and one in his last five, 5-0 five over for Romanov. Uh, we're going to start with Romanov on this one here. Uh, Romanov, he has finished every single one of his fights except for the Juan Espino fight, which ended in a technical split decision, I believe it was officially labeled. Very strange fight. Finish was crazy. Kind of a real weird, weird sort of outcome. But either way, Romanov undefeated. Here's why. The guy has takedowns in mass. He will take you down relentlessly at 70% clip. So Romanov is getting the takedown more often than not. Super high output. Like I said, he's got that high finish rate and he has tons of control time. He pretty much dominates everyone that he fights, except for Juan Espino. He's dominated everyone that he's fought. And that could be why. Weak level of competition. Most of the guys that Romanov has fought are just not UFC caliber. Even some of the guys he's fought in the UFC, Chase Sherman, not exactly the highest level. Sherman's only actually back in the UFC because he took the fight against Romanov on short notice, and that's how he got the contract again after being cut originally. So Romanov hasn't beaten the best competition, but he's still undefeated, and he does have a lot of upside with his output and even his conditioning because he doesn't tend to gas out as much as a lot of heavyweights would expect uh, with an output like his. So moving over to Tybura. On paper, he has the best takedown defense in the UFC at over an 80% clip. And in the heavyweight division, that is. In the heavyweight division, best takedown defense in the UFC. He uh, should, stylistically, match up really well against Romanov. Because he's a bigger guy. He's got the best uh, heavyweight takedown defense. And he's fought a much higher level competition in the UFC. 
The guy's got 15 UFC fights, most of which are high caliber UFC fighters. Not all of which, most of which. But the knock is he was KO'd in his last time out against Drago. Um, that fight was not his best outing. Uh, that KO was nasty. Alexander Volkov, aka Drago, hit him into the shadow realm right there. It was over. So Tybora coming in off that loss, looking to get this one back. Stylistically, it's a good matchup for him. I wouldn't I wouldn't blame someone for taking a shot at the dog here on Tybora because, like I said, stylistically it plays in his favor. I'm going to go with Romanov on this one. Not a confident pick for me, especially at the odds that he's at right now. But I'm going to take Romanov, take the hype, take the uh, takedowns, take the output. I think if it goes to the decision, it's going Romanov's way. I just don't think Tybura can get that finish on him. So I'm going to go Romanov. Kicking off our main card. Now, real quick, we have both guys here at two and three in their last five fights. And that is not something you want to see with Tyson Pedro being over a minus 750 favorite. Might even be more inflated by the time that you see this video. Tyson Pedro is a massive favorite, and he's two and three in his last five. Same as his opponent, Harry Hunsecker. Here's the thing. I'm going to start this off by breaking down Tyson Pedro and why I think that it's pretty obvious he's going to win. But that should concern you. Along with the injury concerns, he's been away a long time with some injuries. However, he is a very strong kicker. Tyson Pedro will keep range, kick the leg, kick the body, keep you away. And then I think after he keeps, uh, keeps uh, Hunsucker away in this fight with his kicks, maybe in the second round, third round, if it gets that far, that's when he can start implementing his grappling and really just get the finish there. He's generally the more skilled fighter all around in this matchup here. But the problem is he keeps his hands low. And for Harry Hunsucker, he can capitalize on that. He's a big guy. He can hit with some power and he's quick. So if you're keeping your hands low, you've got some injury concerns, there's potential for an upset here. I wouldn't bet on it, but there's potential for the upset here in a matchup where we don't really have a, a lot of things are unknown about Tyson Pedro at this point in his career, especially after just coming back after a very long time off and not really fighting, uh, not really fighting a whole lot in recent memory. So, uh, and like I said, Harry hunsucker has got nothing to lose. He is a massive underdog. Nobody expects him to win this fight. So if he loses, he doesn't lose anything. If he wins, that looks great. Something to take note of, though, this fight is at light heavyweight. Harry Hunsucker is traditionally a heavyweight. Uh, seeing him down at light heavyweight is an interesting thing for me. I wonder how he'll look on the scales. But assuming everything looks, looks good and checks out, should be an interesting fight for as long as it lasts. It'll probably end in a finish one way or the other. I'm going to take Tyson Pedro here. But, you know, it's uh, steep odds for, for a potential upset. All right, and so how this fight got onto the main card, I am not sure. But according to the UFC website, this is the second fight on the main card. We have Lucy Putalova taking on Wu Yanan. Now, the record here for the last five for Lucy Putalova is 4-1. and one. However, it is to be noted that all of this is outside of the UFC. She was cut from the UFC went 5-1 and one in a promotion called Octagon over some very low-level competition, and that is what brought her back into the UFC for this fight against Wu Yanan, who is 1-4 in her last five fights in the UFC. Her only win is over Lauren Mueller, who at the time was undefeated, but has not won a fight since. So the best win is over someone who's about a 500 fighter right now. Uh, this fight shouldn't be on the main card. This should be, a prelim. This should be early prelims. And, you know, it sucks to say that because this is going to be an exciting fight. And that's probably how it ended up on the main card. Both of these two fighters can eat a punch and keep going forward. Both of them love the strike. I don't see a lot of takedowns coming here. Yanan has been, uh, Yanan has been poor, sorry, in her takedowns over her UFC career. Putalova just doesn't shoot them very often. So, basically, they both want to throw hands. Neither one wants to block punches. They want to keep walking forward. Takes a punch well is not something you want to see on your stat line, as well as can eat shots and fire back. You don't want to take those shots, but they do. Uh, for the positives, I don't know if it's positive. Put a level will come forward, and she will do so recklessly, and she'll probably land some volume in there. Uh, for Yanan, she does mix her striking up well. She changes levels on the striking, mixes kicks and punches. Yeah, this 
this could be a fun fight, but I don't know. Other than that, I don't see why it should be on the main card. I'm going to take Putalova just because I don't think Wu Yanan is UFC caliber. Not that Putalova is. Yeah, I got to pick one of them, I guess. All right, Putalova. She's had more wins lately. We'll take it. If you've enjoyed this video so far, go ahead and hit that like button on this video. And don't, don't forget to leave a comment down below. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you thought about my picks. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? And even better yet, after you've watched the fight card and you found that I picked a bunch of fights wrong, you can come back here and tell me how much of a big old dummy I am for picking who and so-and-so over who and who. And guess what? I'll probably even comment back because what the heck else am I going to do with myself? So don't forget to like the video, comment. See you in the next fight. All right, and for the fight that I'm most looking forward to this evening, we've got Jose Aldo taking on Marab Dvoshvili. Uh, both guys coming in with a hot bit of momentum here. Uh, Dvoshvili 5-0 in his last five fights, so that's right there is enough to say. Uh, Jose Aldo 3-2 in his last five, but he's fought some really high-level competition. Uh, one of those wins is over Marlon Vera, who we just saw last weekend knock out Dominic Cruz completely cold. Um, he's also got a good big win over Rob Font and Pedro Munoz in, that, in those three wins. Um, so I'm going to kind of break these guys down a little bit. I'm going to start with Marab, Marab here. Uh, he's relentless in the pursuit of the takedown. We've seen it in every one of his fights. He will go for takedowns like crazy. 7.3 takedowns for 15 minutes as the average. He is just a takedown machine, one after the other. He's very resilient as well. So you can hit him as he's coming in for those takedowns, and he's going to keep coming, and he's going to keep coming. Even when you rattle him, as we saw in the Marlon Marais fight, he took that shot, Was looked like he was out cold, he was on spaghetti legs, but no, bounced back, came back, and won the fight. And that goes into what I was talking about with, uh, with those takedowns. He's a strong minute winner. So Murat will get the takedown. He'll be winning on the pressure grappling, hitting you with small shots, looking, looking for different submissions, looking for different striking openings. But basically, he's winning minutes. And he does that in just about every single one of his fights at a very high pace. However, he's going up against... Jose Aldo, who 91% takedown defense in his career in the UFC. 91% takedown defense is incredible. And I think a lot of that comes because people, A, they can't take him down, but B, why would you want to take him down? Because Jose Aldo, although he's a great striker, is super slick off his back on the ground. He can, he can put a pace on a guy on the ground as well as on the feet. He is going to have a big speed advantage in the striking here against Devalishvili. Jose Aldo has some of the fastest hands in the Bantamweight division, for sure. Not only that, he's going to be the more well-rounded striker, more polished striker, and he has some of the most devastating leg kicks that we've ever seen in the featherweight division. And now that he's down at Bantamweight, if he gets those going against a guy like Javon Feely, kind of take away some of, those, the, some of the, the, the power and the explosion in those takedowns. If you can get that going earlier, uh, that would be a, that'd be a huge victory inside of the fight for Aldo. Uh, one other thing to make note of here is that Jose Aldo has a much higher level of competition under his under his belt. Obviously, he was the champion for many years at featherweight. I couldn't tell you how many years, but he was undefeated for what was it, like ten years or something like that through WEC and into the UFC until we all know how Conor McGregor knocked him out in thirteen seconds. Yeah, we got it. He took a while to bounce back after that heartbreaker. I'm a big Jose Aldo fan, but. Jose Aldo fought the way higher level of competition. Marab Dvalishvili beat some good guys coming up. He got that win over Marlon Marais, who's a talented UFC fighter, or was. I think he just retired recently. But good competition, but nowhere near the level of Aldo. Aldo has been in the highest of pressure situations, and I think that's going to benefit him here on a big pay-per-view card. This fight's going to be a fun one. This is the people's main event, if you ask me. Maybe don't take my pick to heart because I am a big Jose Aldo fan, but I'm going to take Jose Aldo here because I think, A, he's the much better striker. B, if it does go to the ground, he is far from helpless on the ground, unlike a lot of the opponents that Marab Dvalashvili has fought. With that said, I think Aldo is going to be able to control the fight. He may even end up taking down Dvalashvili, as we saw him do in his last fight, to really cement that victory and kind of write out some... Uh, right at the end of the fight to, you know, put a stamp on things, make sure he secures the round. So I'm going to take Jose Aldo. I'm going to say by decision, but I also wouldn't be surprised here if he can get the victory, knock him out on the feet. We have seen Marab 
rattled in the past, even though he does typically bounce back. But the pick, Jose Aldo, my favorite fight of the night. Let me know what you think. On to the co-main event of the evening. We've got Paulo Costa taking on Luke Rockhold. Paulo Costa coming in 3-2 and two in his last five fights. His last two actually losses against two of the best in the division. Actually, they're probably the two best in the division currently, being Israel Asanya and Marvin Vittori. So, no shame there, but at the same time, still on a two-fight skid. Luke Rockhold, on the other hand, 2-3 and three in his last five. All three of those losses coming in the way of KO. Not a good sign. Uh, his two wins, not over the best level of competition. But 2-3 and three in his last five, 3-2 three and two in his last five. I'm going to start over here with uh, Paulo Costa. The guy's a KO machine. 85% of his victories have ended in KO. He has knocked out plenty on his way towards his title shot against Israel Adesanya. Hasn't been as good since then, as, as it appears. He had some tr trouble with making weight in the uh, Vittori fight. The wine thing with the, with the Israel Adesanya fight where he drank some wine and tried to get to sleep and didn't nothing went right for him. I don't know. Take, it, take that how you will. Either way, last two fights not looking good, but before that, the guy was a KO behemoth. Uh, he has 80% takedown defense in the UFC, which is also impressive because he has fought some wrestlers, guys like uh, Yoel Romero, for example. But not too many people have shot a bunch of takedowns on him because usually they're getting knocked out. <laughs> With that, he does keep his power late into his fight. So, so for Paulo Costa, as the fight drags into the third round, Rockhold's going to need to still be able to avoid those shots if he doesn't want to stay, if he doesn't want to end up sleeping. Let's put it that way. So um, so for Paulo Costa here, the, the real path to victory is pretty obvious. He's looking for the knockout. And I think it it's a good path to victory for him because Rockhold, like I said, he was knocked out in all three of those losses in his recent five fights. So with that, though, there are some positives. He's a very technical striker and he has a five-inch reach advantage to use that striking to keep Paulo Costa at, at range. He can hit him with some question mark kicks, long rangey front kicks, things like that. He'll be able to hit Costa before Costa can hit him. However, his best path to victory might be his grappling. Luke Rockhold is very skilled on the ground. He has slick submission game, super talented when it gets to the mat, and he can then avoid some of that power from Costa. But like I said, the problem is 80% takedown defense. Will he be able to get the fight to the ground? Costa is a very strong opponent. And with that, both guys, even though they're both very strong fighters, struggle very hard to make 185. In fact, Costa couldn't actually do it in his last fight, and just days before the fight, decided to tell Marvin Vittori that, hey, why don't we fight at 205? It'll be fine, right? Vittori stepping up, doing the darn thing like he did, still got the win, but Costa obviously struggles to make 185. Luke Rockhold famously said that it was killing him to make 185 in the past, I don't foresee that not being the case currently as he's, he's gotten older. So obviously that's not going to be easier to make weight as when you get older, it gets harder to make that weight. Also, Rockhold coming back after tons of injuries, a whole slew of them. He's been scheduled or like rumored to be having a fight coming back to the UFC. Uh, I don't know, how, dozens of times, maybe not dozens, count a, a few times now, more than one, more than three uh, with different opponents. Uh, I think it was just recently he was supposed to come back and fight uh, Sean Strickland. Fight fell out. Rockhold's injured. Go figure. This one seems to be happening. So as long as nothing crazy comes up before then, we're going to get the fight. It'll be interesting to see how Rockhold looks. My pick for this one, I'm taking Costa. I don't think that Rockhold can take a shot anymore. I think Costa knocks him out with the first big shot out of the lands, and Rockhold will likely get hit at least once in this fight to dodge to to move out of the way of strikes he tends to lean back rather than move side to side and i think uh with costa coming down coming down the pipe he can throw one two three four shots in a row and he can hit uh hit rockle with any of the, any number of those but it'll only take one rockle's going down big shot costa but if rockle gets it to the ground i could be totally wrong let me know what you think all right, and we've made it this far to the main event of the evening. We're looking at Kamaru Usman taking on Leon Edwards. So Usman coming in 5-0, and obviously in his last five fights. The guy hasn't lost in ages. He only has that one loss on his record. I think it was his second MMA fight ever. Uh, so Usman 5-0. and uh, Looking at Leon Edwards, 4-0-1. You must remember that uh, no contest against Bilal Muhammad with the eye pokes. 
Uh, hopefully we don't see that again in this fight. That would be a terrible way to end a main event. I'm hoping that's not the case. Hopefully we get a clear winner. Um, but we're going to break it down real quick. So something to take into account. These two have fought before. It was clear back in 2015 in which Kamara Usman won that fight uh, by controlling Edwards typically uh, or, uh, predominantly with the wrestling. So Kamara Usman got that victory back in 2015. Both fighters have evolved a lot since then and changed a lot since then. Things have uh, altered their styles. Usman has become more of a striker lately. Some say that's because of the bad knees that he has, making it hard for him to wrestle. Others say he's just fallen in love with that KO power that he has. So for Usman, he hasn't really beaten a ton of different guys while he's held the title. He's fought, in, uh, he's fought a lot of the guys twice. He's fought uh, uh, Masvidal twice, Covington twice. He did beat Gilbert Burns. That was the one. Uh, that was a one shot there. But like, uh, but like I was saying, he hasn't fought a lot of different opponents. And here we are again with another rematch. So uh, the first time they fought, Usman was not the champion yet. But like I said, it's another rematch for him. Uh, for for Edwards, he's the far superior striker here. So Edwards should be able to outstrike Usman and at just about every angle. The only thing that we're going to run into here that might be a problem for, for Edwards is that Usman is a very powerful striker when he does land. So, uh, but the, the striking advantage is clear for Leon Edwards. Gets him, uh, gets him the nod there. Very talented striker. He tends to stay just ahead on the scorecards. Uh, doesn't typically drop you with one shot, but uh, not to say he can't. Just saying that's not his, typically his style. He just tends to stay ahead on the scorecards. Uh, piecing you up as you go. Um, and, but he has vastly improved his grappling throughout the course of, of the career ever since 2015 when he lost to uh, Kamaru Usman that first fight. For Usman over here, he has top-tier, uh, high-level, excellent-level wrestling. There are, you will be hard-pressed to find a better wrestler in the UFC. Usman is that guy. He used that to beat uh, Edwards in the first fight, obviously. But now he's more falling in love with his one-shot power. So he's been knocking guys out. He knocked out Gilbert Burns, if you remember. Uh, he knocked out... Uh, uh, Jorge Masvidal uh, broke Colby Covington's jaw in their first fight. All that good stuff. So, so he he has kind of fallen in love with the power, but that wrestling is still there. Should he decide to use it, and who knows? If maybe it is the knees that's keeping him from doing the wrestling, and if so, maybe he won't use it in this fight. And if that's the case, we might see a new champion. If not, Usman's gonna be able to use the wrestling. And I still think, even though Edwards has improved, I still think uh, Usman's wrestling is gonna be far superior to that of Edwards. Uh, one, one other little bit of a note there is because Usman does already have a win over Edwards, there is a mental advantage there. The doubt in Leon Edwards' mind, the confidence in Kamaru Usman's, typically someone of, the, of a championship level isn't going to get too overconfident and uh, just overlook his opponent. So I don't think we have to worry about Usman doing that here. And like I said, the guy hasn't lost a fight since his second MMA fight. He's he's the pound for pound best right now. Arguably, there is a case to be made for uh, Alexander Volkanovsky, obviously, but like I said, the guy is the real deal. For Leon Edwards, really talented fighter. Could he get this one done? Yeah, totally. Especially if those knees are really bothering Usman and he's not able to use the wrestling at the level that he was in their first fight. But I'm gonna say that regardless of how banged up the knees are, Usman's gonna be able to get the wrestling done. And for that, I'm picking Usman but I'm not as confident in this pick as I have been in some of Usman's fights up until recently. Plus, not only that, coming off of the broken hand he's had recently, he hasn't been able to practice his striking as much as he would have probably liked to. So this might just be the perfect the perfect medley of, of scenario um, and, and happenstance for, for Edwards to get the victory here, but I'm still going to take Usman. You can't bet against the guy. He's proven us wrong time and time again. Got dropped by Gilbert Burns, came back, knocked him out. I'm taking Usman. If you think I'm wrong, let me know. If Edwards pulls this off, you can come back in the comments and tell me what a big, dumb idiot I am. And guess what? I'll agree with you because I've been, I've been picking against Usman. I haven't picked against him in recent fights, but I picked against Usman in the past and I've been proven wrong every single time. So you can let me know in the comments if I'm a big dummy.